If you're new to this channel, you may consider subscribing and hit the bell icon so that you continue to receive the updates. Please share it with all others who might benefit. Let's get started. Hello and welcome. In this video, we'll be talking about a very important concept and that's related to data leakage. Now, it's something that we have to prevent under all circumstances whenever we're working on a data. And we'll discuss why this happens. There are certain common reasons why data leakage happens. Let's start with what is data leakage? So data leakage in machine learning occurs when information from outside the training data set is used to create a model, leading to overly optimistic performance estimates or misleading results. Basically what happens is that your performance on the train set is excellent. It's very good, but you are unable to sustain that performance on the test set. Now you might be relating it with overfitting, but when we talk about leakage, it's something which is a mistake that happens at the stage when we are working on the data. And that mistake leads to a situation like an overfitting at a later stage. So we'll talk about it from that perspective. Let's talk about what could be the primary reasons behind data leakage. So first is target leakage. Next is data pre-processing leakage. And this is where we'll be spending most of our time. And the last one is temporal leakage. So we'll strike off the temporal leakage right away because this is more to do with the time sequence data. If you're dealing with the data which is time sequenced, where the order of occurrence matters, if we end up using the future information to estimate or guess the past, that's called temporal leakage. The problem is that you do not know the future values. How can you use them to estimate the past? That's not the way it is. The whole idea of predictions and forecasting is that you know the past and you're trying to estimate the future, not the other way. So we'll strike off temporal leakage right away and we'll move ahead with the target leakage. Target leakage happens when information that would not be available at the time of prediction is included in the training data. For example, if you're trying to predict whether it's going to rain or not, and you have a feature that you've captured which says rains in millimeter. So if you already know how much it rained in millimeter, it doesn't make sense to predict whether it rained or not. In other words, only if it rained is when you would know how much it rained. It should not be the other way. Similarly, if you're trying to predict whether a patient is suffering from a coronary heart disease or not, and you are using a feature which talks about change of medication, and the way your data was captured was that the medication was changed after the patient was detected to be suffering from a coronary heart disease. It's not the other way. You don't start giving the medicines first and then detect a disease, you first detect a disease and then you change the medication accordingly. So these are common mistakes that happen. You'll find them all across in the solutions. You would see people using information which was only captured after the target column was confirmed to have occurred. But the fact is that you would not have this information when you're going to make decisions. For example, you would not know it rained or not and that's why you're doing the project. You're trying to predict whether it will rain or not given other information from various sensors and things like that. Similarly, for the heart example, you do not know whether a patient is suffering from a heart disease or not. That's what your task is. If you use information that was captured after detecting the heart disease, and that's called a target leakage because you have another representation that is borrowed from the target variable. It's not a predictor, it's an after effect. Now we'll focus primarily on the main piece, which is related to data pre-processing. So how does the leakage happen due to data pre-processing. Let's take an example. Let's take a very simple data set. We have three columns. We have a column called consumption, which captures the internet usage in megabytes. We have a column called interruption, which captures whether there was any service interruption for the consumer. And then finally you have, let's say a target column, which predicts whether the consumer would have renewed the service or not. Now, one of the features here, if you see consumption, is numerical in nature. And while working on various kinds of models and data, your requirement might be to scale this feature. So you want to bring it to, let's say, a standard normal form. At what stage should we scale it? Should we scale it right away? Taking the entire data, maybe we can calculate the mean and standard deviation of this particular column, which is consumption. Let's say we found out the mean is 404 and standard deviation is approximately 191. So should we take these values of mean and standard deviation and apply the formula, which is X minus mu by sigma, which is how the standard scaling work. This would transform the entire data into a standard normal form with a mean zero and a standard deviation one. Of course you can do that, but would that be right? The answer is no, let's understand this. So generally when you're working on data and you're going to make a prediction, you always park some data as validation or test. 
Now, let's say out of the 10 records that we have, we have randomly chosen these three records to be parked for the validation purposes. For example, we've chosen the index two, four, and seven. So index two goes to the test data, index four goes to the test data, and index seven goes to the test data. Finally, this is what you're left with. So your train data is not the entire data. Your train data comprises of only these seven records. And the three records that you randomly chose have been parked for the testing purpose. Now we are clear that we have some data to be used for training purpose and some data to be used for test purpose. Let's calculate the mean and standard deviation of the train data. This value is 401 as mean and 202 as standard deviation. Similarly, we can calculate the mean and standard deviation for the test data, which is 410 and 201. Now the question is, should we be scaling the train data using its mean and standard deviation? The answer is yes. But how should we scale the test data? Should we scale the test data using its mean and standard deviation? And if your answer is yes, then that will be wrong. Why? Because test data is future data. You don't know about it. You will be using the train data's mean and standard deviation to scale it. And why did we park it separately? Why did we not scale the overall data together? Because like I said, the test data is future data. It is not supposed to be participating in the calculation of the mean and standard deviation. Last time when we looked at the overall data, we had these three values from the test side participating in the calculations of mean and standard deviation. And the values of mean and standard deviation derived, of course, had an influence of these values too. At times, these values could be highly influential. And at the training stage, we do not want to have any influence of the test data. It's called leakage. It's like you're going to write an exam and before writing the exam, you got to know what's going to get asked there. So you may have an overall idea about what all is covered in your course and your exam is based out of that. But you cannot be exactly told what are the questions that are going to come in your exam. That's the only reason your test would never participate in any calculation. Any hint relative to test is not supposed to be given to the trained data. So when you calculate the mean and standard deviation considering everything, every single value in your train data is going to get somewhat influenced by the test data because it participated in the mean and standard deviation calculation as well. So a key takeaway is use the mean and standard deviation as you compute from the training data to scale the train data and the same mean and standard deviation will be used to scale the test data. Now let's say we have some missing values in a few features. Let's say we have these NANs or not a number of values. Once again, the same question comes. Let's say we choose to do this treatment with the median. So we find out the median for the train data for this given column consumption is 400 and median for the test data, we only have two values here. So it's going to be an average only, it's 365. So we know that we'll be using the median of 400 to treat the train data. Now the question is, should we have considered the entire data to calculate these medians? The answer is no. Once again, because you don't want test data to participate in your training imputations. So a better way is to first split and then do the imputation. Once again, the median value that you obtain for the training data would be used for imputations for the test data as well. So even for missing value treatment, the same logic applies. It's not done overall considering the entire data. It's done after splitting the data. Yes, you may argue that this may not have that strong an influence like the way it had on scaling. Why? Because scaling is performed on every single value. Missing value treatment that you're doing is still being done selectively for the rows where the data is missing. So it may not affect the overall data, but scaling was a big no-no to begin with because every single value was being scaled. Still, if you have a good proportion of missing data, this might work adversely. And that's why it's recommended. It's only after doing the split is when you do the missing value treatment. Extend this to the idea of imputers. So if you're doing an imputation by median or you're doing a KNN imputation, any kind of imputation, you can always perform on train first and then extend that to test rather than doing it on the overall data. Let's talk about the outlier treatment. Once again, you do not want to estimate the outlier boundaries keeping the entire data together. You would calculate that upper limit and lower limit for the train data and the same upper limit and lower limit capping and flooring would be applied to the test data. Because if your test values start participating in determining the outlier boundaries, that might also influence some corrections in the training data. And you don't want to have that leakage. So once again, after splitting is when you determine the outlier boundaries, apply appropriate treatment, and then extend that treatment to the test data as well. 
Let's move on to the multicollinearity. Now, when you're doing multicollinearity, once again, you're not going to check multicollinearity on the entire data. You have to check it after splitting the data only for the train set. Once you check it on the train set, and if you find certain features are correlated, and let's say for a particular model that you want to apply later, correlations need to be eliminated. Whether you drop some features using Pearson's correlation, or you apply variance inflation factor, or you do a principal component analysis. Whatever you find out on training data would be extended to the test data. So let's say out of 15 features, you found three features that were supposed to be dropped in the training data, maybe through VIF. The same three features without any check can be dropped for the test data. Your model will have a certain number of features and those are the features on which you will be making predictions, both for training and test. So you can't have different features for train and different features for test. It has to be a standard. If you're dropping certain features based on the training data, same features need to be dropped for the test data as well. Now for this reason only, most of the inbuilt transformation methods in scikit-learn have both fit transform and transform functions. Fit transform is applied to the training set while transform is applied to the test set. You must find this code familiar. We are instantiating an imputer here, which is a simple imputer with let's say a strategy of mean. And we are doing a fit transform on the train data as you can see in the second line, imputer.fit transform on X train. And if you see the last line, we are doing just the transform on the test data. What does it do? So it calculates the mean value as per the train data. Wherever you have a missing value in train, it is going to put the mean here. And even for test, it is going to put the same mean wherever a value is missing. Similarly, if you do unsupervised learning, let's say if you do PCA to eliminate multicollinearity, you will do a fit transform on train to learn about the correlation patterns and you'll just do a transform on test. Now you'll find in a lot of competitions on sites like Kaggle, etc., they already give you the data into two parts. They give you a train set and they give you a test set. The train set would contain the target column and the test set would have all the independent features but would not contain the target column. Basically, they use it to evaluate your performance there. Now what you can do is you can take that entire train set and divide into two parts or apply some kind of a cross-validation technique. You want to do some amount of validation before you actually make your final submission. So whatever we said or talked about test here is applicable for the validation set when it comes to competitions. You want to have the partitions done and then apply the data pre-processing rather than having the entire data pre-processed together. If you do so, you'll face the problem of leakage. So I hope this gives you some clarity on how you may want to proceed for your data pre-processing activities especially whenever you have to make a prediction. Thank you.